And now, Dr. Watson, what about this adventure of the fabulous celebrities? Well, Mr. Harris, it began in the year 1901, a year when Holmes was at the very pinnacle of success. By the turn of the century, as you know, the name of Sherlock Holmes was famous in every corner of the civilized world. And people stared at him whenever he walked out of our quarters at Baker Street. And then, very suddenly, it became very dangerous to be a celebrated person in the city of London. In the short space of three weeks, four persons of great prominence were struck down by a mysterious assassin. And finally, in great desperation, Inspector Lestrade asked us to appear at Scotland Yard. Mr. Holmes, you understand Scotland Yard's conducting its own investigation of these baffling murders. No, quite Inspector Lestrade, quite. In due time, of course, we should no doubt trap this peculiar assassin. However, knowing your taste for the unusual and admitting that you have some talent in these matters... Coming I... from you, Inspector, I consider that a great compliment. <laughs> it is indeed. We've never been reluctant to give the official police a hand in these uh, unusual matters, eh, Holmes? No, Watson, we have not. Now then, Inspector. Yes, yes, Mr. Holmes. Let us review the facts. A mysterious and deadly killer is roaming the metropolis of London. His special victims are persons of great prominence. In the last three weeks, he's assassinated a great English beauty, a champion heavyweight pugilist, a world-famous astronomer, and a famous admiral. Yes, and every one of them a likely candidate for any Hall of Fame. Quite, Watson, quite. But to continue, Inspector, in each case, the celebrated victims' valuables were not taken from their corpses. In short... We may deduce that those important people were murdered for some other motive rather than money. That is correct, Mr. Holmes. But we have found no clue, no trace. Exactly, Inspector Lestrade. You found no clue, no trace. You have let the trail go cold and we must make a fresh start. Come, Watson. Where to, Holmes? Baker Street, my dear fellow, Baker Street. To think, to plan, to use the tools of logic. Assuming, of course, that we are fortunate enough to find a cab in this foul weather. By Jove, Holmes, we're in luck. There's a cab at the curb right here on Derby Street. You can just make it out in this uh, beastly fog. Yes, Watson. Hello there. Hello, cab! Well, he's seen us. <laughs> you know, I must say I anticipated a dreary and chilly wait. It's rather a surprise. The cab driver. He's driving his horse straight. At... Holmes, he's trying to run us down. Look out! Uh, Holmes, uh... Are you all right? Yes, Watson, I'm quite all right. Just managed to get out of the way of those horses. Yes, but that driver, what the deuce was he trying to do? Obvious, my dear Watson. He was trying to kill me. Oh, thank heaven, Holmes, we're finally here at Baker Street. I've had a feeling that some kind of danger was stalking us through this wretched fog. Yes, quite, Watson. As for myself, I am aware of the danger, not as a mere presentiment, but as an actual fact. What do you mean? The driver of the carriage on Derby Street. He might very well be the assassin we seek. Remember, Watson, I am a person of some renown and am therefore vulnerable to his rather peculiar taste for victims. But here's our door. Uh, what we need now, Holmes, is a good fire. Holmes! The top of the steps, outside our flat! Yes. There's someone lurking there. Shadow. Quick, Watson, downward. Down there. Holmes. Holmes, are you? I'm all right. Bullet just grazed my neck, went through the collar of my greatcoat. Quick, up the stairs, after him. Well, Holmes, the beggar went up the stairs onto the roof. I lost him in the fog, curse it. Holmes. Yes, Watson. Do you think this assassin is. Is the same who has accounted for the others? Yes, I most certainly think he is. The driver of that carriage and the man lurking in our hallway are one and the same. Well, Holmes, you've got to be careful. He's made two attempts on your life in one night. The beggar may try still again. Undoubtedly he will, Watson. It seems that for the moment the hunter becomes the hunted. But I hope to reverse that order in a very short time. Dash it, Holmes. I must say you're rather matter-of-fact about this whole thing. Quite, Watson. I'm thoroughly aware that my personal existence is in great jeopardy. But I cannot allow any emotion on this score to cloud my reason. The assassin who seeks my life is a very cool fellow, and I must meet him on his own ground. But the hour is late, Watson. There'll be time enough tomorrow to deal with my assailant. Watson! Eh? Watson, 
wake up. Yeah, what is it? Holmes, what the devil? We seem to have a nocturnal visitor. Oh. Mr. Holmes! Mr. Holmes, for the love of heaven, let me in. Better have your pistol ready, Watson. Yes, I'm all ready, Holmes. Wonder what the juice the beggar wants. Three o'clock in the morning. You shall soon see, my dear fellow. Well, it's Sir Hartley Ames, governor of the Bank of England. Mr. Holmes, shut the door, quick. By Jove, he's, uh, he's got a gash across his cheek. Yes, yes, Dr. Watson. An assassin attacked me with a knife near my home. Just grazed me. But it's not serious. The bleeding stopped. Yes. Mr. Holmes, I, I came straight here. Uh, pray be seated, Sir Hartley. Rest yourself. Oh, thank you. Now then, you say you were attacked? Yes, Mr. Holmes, yes. I, I couldn't get a glimpse of him in the fog, but I think the fellow followed me to your very door. Hmm. Interesting. Very. Then, Holmes, it must be the same fellow. Undoubtedly, Watson, the killer is abroad tonight pursuing his strange custom of hunting illustrious persons, such as uh, Sir Hartley. Uh, how does it happen, Sir Hartley, that you didn't go to the official police? Oh, impossible, Dr. Watson. That could mean only disaster. The financial structure of the empire is based on delicate factors. If it became known that my life was in jeopardy, it might cause a panic on the exchange, a, a run on the bank. Sir Hartley is quite right, Watson. Oh, Mr. Holmes, what shall I do? At the moment, there's but one thing to do, Sir Hartley. Dr. Watson and I will escort you to your home, and when you get there, lock your door and bolt your windows, and under no circumstances leave unless I summon you. <laughs> Now that we've seen Sir Hartley safely under lock and key, we can look forward to a night's sleep, eh? Mm. Good Lord, it's five in the morning. Yes, Watson, it's good to be back at Baker Street. Uh, especially in view of this beastly weather. The fog has turned to rain. Oh, someone's coming our way. Yes. Begging your pardon, gentlemen, which one of you is Sherlock Holmes? I am Sherlock Holmes. Ah, indeed. So you are the great Holmes, the world's most famous detective. Look here, old man. I... Now, please, Watson. Now then, sir, state your business. Oh, oh, my dear, Mr. Holmes, I have no business. It, it, uh, it's just that I wanted to uh, uh, look at you. It isn't often a poor man like myself can stand face to face with a great person like yourself. No, indeed, it isn't often. I must say you look exactly like your photographs. Exactly. Thank you. I am flattered. And uh, now, my good man, if you've had your fill of staring at me, we should like to enter our quarters. Oh, no offense, Mr. Holmes, no offense at all. It's just that I'll be able to tell my friend I've talked with a great Holmes. Uh, the cheek of the fellow, Holmes. The infernal impudence of the bounder. Watson. Eh? Did you notice that old man's coat and shoes? I know. Interesting. Very. Holmes, what in blazes are you talking about? First, Watson, the man's coat was hardly wet, yet it's raining. Yes, I know. Second, certain areas of his boots seem to be waterproofed. The rain dampened the leather only in spotches. Well, what of it? I merely mention these as elementary observations, Watson, which may or may not prove significant. But for the first time, I believe I see a glimmer of light in this very intriguing adventure. Well, Dr. Watson, so far it's been quite a story. Yes, Mr. Harris. And I might add that events thereafter shaped themselves with dizzying speed. I shall relate to you the second half of this remarkable adventure after you tell your audience some remarkable facts about Clippercroft clothes. They are remarkable indeed, Dr. Watson. When I describe the qualities of Clippercraft clothes to you, I myself sometimes think that Clippercraft values seem too good to be true. But Clippercraft fabrics are actually as luxurious as they are long on wear. And the superior talent of Clippercraft experts shows up admirably in the smart hang of your jacket, the comfortable, roomy fit of your Clippercraft suit. It's when you check all these superb features against the amazingly low price for suits bearing the Clippercraft label that you realize Clippercraft values are nothing short of sensational. Only forty and forty-five dollars. Why, even a pure worsted suit with the Clippercraft label costs only forty-five dollars. Yes, you save plenty. Because more than 1,200 independent stores throughout America have concentrated their vast purchasing power to make these great Clippercraft values possible. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes bearing the Clippercraft label. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suits, top coats, and overcoats. 
In Manhattan, Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th. John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street. In Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss. In Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark. And in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. And now, Dr. Watson, you are relating to us the adventure of the fabulous celebrity. Yes, Mr. Harris, I was. On the evening after our encounter with the strange old man, a note was thrust under our door. It carried the waxen seal of the Bank of England, and its signer was Sir Hartley Ames. It was an urgent message from Sir Hartley, bidding us to meet him that night at a warehouse he owned at Iron Gate Wharf, near London Bridge. The note said simply that Sir Hartley had some new and vital information on the assassin, and he wished to transmit this information to us. I was watching my friend's face as he finished reading the letter, and I saw his eyes narrow. Then quickly, Holmes examined the seal through his magnifying glass. Aha! Uh-huh. What is it? My dear Watson, this seal of the Bank of England is a forgery. A forgery? Precisely. A devilishly clever piece of work. A fine imitation. The forgery, nevertheless. Then the letter. Is bogus, obviously. Well, it's a trap. Someone is trying to lure us to that warehouse. Quite. Well, then we'd better hurry to Sir Hartley's and warn him. I fear it's too late, Watson. I'm willing to wager that Sir Hartley has in some similar manner been lured from his home. I'm willing to wager further that he is at the warehouse. Yes, but Holmes, if it's a trap, surely we're not going. On the contrary, we are. Perhaps, Watson, we can spring the killer's trap without savoring the cheese. So, the house is a dark and chilly place. Must say, deserted. And as if I was you there, Watson, it only seems deserted. I have a feeling we're being watched. Tell you the truth, so do I. Walking up this corridor between these huge piles of machinery. Yes, marine machinery. Sir Hartley Ames, among other things, owns a steamship liner. <coughs> Holmes. What is it? I, I just kicked something. What was it? Uh, something soft. It felt like... A body? Yes. Quick, Watson, the match. Here you are, Holmes. Good heavens. It's Sir Hartley Ames. Yes, shot through the heart. And note, Watson, there is a flake of paraffin in his left nostril. A significant detail, I might add. Yes, but hold it. What are you doing? A quick search of Sir Hartley's pockets. I have an idea that... Aha! Uh-huh. What is it, Holmes? A note, Watson. A forged note from myself to Sir Hartley asking him to meet us here. So that's how Sir Hartley was lured from his home. Precisely. You remember I gave him strict orders not to move unless he heard from me. Yes, sir. Watson, that pile of crates just above it is toppling down. Look out! Up! Watson, are you all right? Yes, Holmes, I... There goes the killer. He's running toward the rear entrance. Halt, you blackguard! Halt! The, the beggar got away from us again. He did indeed, Watson. Oh, I must confess, Holmes, I'm not the hand with the, with the pistol I was at my wand. You know, time and age dim a man's eye, I'm afraid. <laughs> I, I saw the bounder shadow uh, moving along the fence behind the warehouse here. I saw him go through the rear gate. Uh, yet I missed it all the way. <laughs> Come, Watson, don't be too upset. Our quarry sought to kill two birds with one stone, but he managed to down only one. Moreover, in his escape, he's unwittingly given us some valuable information. It is significant that he did not hurdle that low fence that chose the long way to the gate, even though you were firing at him. Well, I, I confess, Holmes, I... Don't you, Watson? Come, man. Come. The conclusion is elementary. At any rate, I'm becoming rather tired of being stalked by this assassin. I know who he is, and it's high time we closed with him. You know who he is? I do indeed. More than that, I know where I can find him. Well, In a large brick building on Marylebone Road, just east of Baker Street, and only a few doors from our own room. Yes, that brick building is... Precisely, Watson. It houses that famous London museum, Madame Tussauds Waxworks. What in blazes, Holmes, would the killer be doing at Madame Tussauds Waxworks? Suppose we go there and find out, Watson. Uh, you mean tomorrow morning? On the contrary, Watson. I mean tonight. Uh, All right, Watson, close that window, Jimmy. Uh, right, Holmes. Uh, I suppose. 
proves you're aware we're breaking an entry. My dear Watson, I cannot quibble with legal technicalities at this moment. Come, let us inspect this museum. Oh, it's an eerie place at night, I must say. Hmm. All these wax figures standing around? <laughs> they look juicy and lifelike now. Look, Hope. Here's Napoleon Bonaparte. Hmm. Julius Caesar, Oliver Cromwell. Holmes. Wait, it's... Yes, Watson, a new wax effigy of Sir Hartley Ames made within the last ten minutes. The waxen face is still warm to the touch, and the scar from the assassin's knife still shows. And the killer made a mold of Sir Hartley's face as he lay dead in the warehouse. Precisely, eh? Watson. You recall the fake of paraffin we found in Sir Hartley's nostril and... Watson. Yes, Holmes? There's a light under that door. So there is. We shall come to grips with our quarry very soon now. Keep your pistol at the ready and follow me. There was no one in here, huh? It's true. Seems to be a small workshop. Yes, it... Holmes! Good Lord! Look at that waxen statue. Yes. You recognize it, Watson? Well, it's a waxen image of you, Holmes. It is indeed. Made by a master artist. Our friend the assassin giving it a little preliminary work before he did away with me. I do think the nose is a little too aquiline and the face rather thin, but... Watson, get back against the wall. The killer's coming back into his workshop. But Holmes, who is it? Obvious. The strange old man we met on the pavement at the entrance to Baker Street. Be ready when he comes in, Watson. Right. Stand where you are! What? And don't reach for that knife, my dear fellow. I assure you, Dr. Watson will not hesitate to blow your head off at the slightest provocation. That's all. You've caught me, Mr. Holmes. You've finally caught old Lassler. I have indeed. And I assure you that you'll be hung for your crimes in very short order. It doesn't matter, Mr. Holmes. Nothing matters. Let them hang me now. Let them hang old Lafleur, the greatest artist in wax the world has ever known. In heaven's name, Lafleur, why did you commit these, these terrible murders? Dr. Watson, I am an artist, a great artist. I, Lafleur who studied under the great Marie to fall. But uh, I am old and sick, and I have not long to live. The museum was about to retire me, but I didn't want to retire. I still had work to do. There are great men and women still living, worthy of recognition in Madame Tussaud's waxwork. I wanted to carve their images in wax for posterity. <laughs> I had so little time, so little time. And the museum would not allow me to immortalize them until they were dead. So you took matters in your own hands? Yes, Mr. Holmes. I couldn't wait for them to die, so I had to kill them myself. You, Mr. Holmes, you were to be my greatest triumph. I had already begun work on you. I reserved a favored place for you here in the museum. Next to Napoleon. Holmes, now we have delivered our assassin to Inspector Lestrade. I still don't see how you detected all the flair. And how you traced him to Madame Tussaud. Obvious, my dear Watson. First of all, I knew the killer was an old man. Remember, he was not agile enough to climb over that low fence in the rear of the warehouse, even when he was under fire. Then, too, Watson, you recall the time we met old Lafleur in the rain in front of our room here? Yes. His coat was only slightly wet. That indicated he walked but a short distance, and Madame Tussaud's is only a few steps from here. But his boots gave him away, Watson. Yes, how? They were waterproof in some spots and wet in others. That meant that his boots were spotched with drippings of wax, Watson, the material of his profession. The forgery of the wax seal of the Bank of England and, of course, the flake of paraffin we found in Sir Hartley's nostril were added evidence. There is only one question left unanswered in my mind, Watson. Yes? What's that, Hope? I wonder how I would have looked in wax, standing next to Napoleon. <laughs> Dr. Watson, that was an exciting adventure indeed. Thank you, Mr. Harris. I thought you'd find it interesting. 
However, I might add that Holmes never got his wish. Madame Tussaud's waxworks burned down in March of 1925, and all the Napoleonic relics were destroyed. I see. And, Doctor, what adventure will you have for us next week? Next week, Mr. Harris, I shall relate to you the adventure of the Bloomsbury Ballad. It concerns a punt ticket, an empty coal scuttle, and a sentimental song. <laughs>